Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. The 70th anniversary pack for Assetto Corsa in commemoration of Ferrari's 70 years in business also brought us, in addition, to three Formula One cars, the SF70H, the F2004, and the 31267. It brought us a whole bunch of absolutely awesome Ferrari road and race cars of the closed wheel tin top variety as well. Here be the star of the others, as far as I'm concerned, this, the 1987 Ferrari 288 GTO. This car is brilliant in every sense of the word, and it's not very often on my channel that I take a look at road cars, and I love all kinds of cars. Of course, race cars and open wheelers in particular are my preferred cup of tea, quite obviously. However, I am a car nut through and through, road car or race car, so let's have a look at a road car today. Why not? The 288 GTO, it was produced by Ferrari between 1984 and 1987. They built a grand total of 272 of these. The car designed by the Pininfarina Design Studio by Leonardo Fioravanti. The car was originally designed to be a Group B racer. Problem was, at the beginning of the 80s, after 1986 in particular, the FIA decided to nix Group B. Group B, those cars were turbocharged monsters. I'm talking about things like the Lancia Stratos and the Monte Carlo Rally, those kinds of things. They were absolute monstrosities of cars. They had ridiculous power outputs for the small displacements of their engines, and it, it was just glorious. The problem was the FIA said that they were too dangerous. There had been a number of really serious accidents, including one very notable fatality. And well, guess what, guys? Group B is done. Therefore, the 288 GTO was converted to be exclusively a road car, and all 272 of those cars are in road spec. At least they were sold in road spec. In terms of the car's design, we obviously have a two-door Berlinetta-style sports car. We've got a rear mid-engine and rear wheel drive. The car is very heavily based on the Ferrari 308 GTB and GTS, which was, of course, the entry-level Ferrari of the era. But more importantly, this 288 GTO was really a testbed for what was to come, of course, the Ferrari F40 for 1987 in commemoration of Ferrari's 40th anniversary, thus beginning a grand tradition of absolutely ridiculous road cars, hypercars today we would call them, the F40, the F50, the Enzo, and now La Ferrari, releasing those cars roughly 10 years apart from one another in commemoration of another decade of Ferrari. The 288 GTO, it is among the rarest Ferraris ever produced due to its low numbers. Additionally, the car really does have the sense of being a test bed for the F40. The engine in this thing, as we mentioned, it is a rear mid-engine layout. It's a 2.9 liter twin turbo V8. It is the Ferrari type F114B. That engine is effectively identical. There have been some tweaks made to it since this, but it's effectively an engine identical to what you'll find in the F40. So. Twin turbo V8 engine, 2.9 liters displacement, running through a 5-speed manual gearbox. Well, that's the F40 powertrain, and certainly you can definitely see some echoes of it here a couple years earlier in the 288 GTO. GTO, by the way, stands for Gran Turismo Homologado, which means Grand Tourer Homologated. In order to comply with the FIA Group B regulations of the time, the cars had to be based on road cars, which meant they had to be homologated. So you had to build some of those cars that would be road legal. Therefore, Ferrari decided to do that with the 288. And well, Group B was nixed anyway. So we were left with this glorious road car as a side effect. Be that as it may, this car is amazingly rare, it is amazingly exclusive, and it is among the holy grail of Ferraris. If anybody has the opportunity to be a Ferrari collector, having one of these cars has got to be near the top, if not at the top, of the list of exclusivity. Therefore, the opportunity that all of us have now in Assetto Corsa to be able to drive this thing as well modeled as it has been done externally, internally, and in terms of the physics and the sounds, it is a wonderful opportunity that all of us Assetto Corsa players now have, both on PC and soon to come on console. 
enough about the history of the car and its specs let's just have a look at this thing kunos once again as they have done on the formula one cars in the 70th anniversary pack they have done a brilliant job modeling this car inside and out let's just have a look here in showroom view oh yeah I don't know about other people out there, I don't know about any of you, but when I think of the name Ferrari, this is the shape that immediately comes to mind. I am not a child of the 80s, I am a child of the 90s, but whenever I see a 1980s road car, well, most of them anyway, there are some very, very notable bad exceptions, but whenever I see a 1980s road car, no matter what it is, I always say, whoa, that's cool. I don't know what it is, maybe it's the shape, maybe it's the ducts cut everywhere, maybe it's the louvers everywhere, maybe it's, you know, these things, the pop-up headlights. I mean, isn't that cool? You pop-up headlights! Why don't we still have pop-up headlights? I know why, it's because of pedestrian safety measures. But, it's just so cool. And that was the 1980s. It was the decade in which technology absolutely exploded. We started to enter the digital age that obviously we're in right now, and I'm only able to talk to all of you right now because of the digital age, but all of that started in the 1980s. The, the global economy, for the most part, was getting better after the 60s and 70s recession years. The Cold War was coming to an end. Everything was just getting better around the world in a lot of places anyway in the 80s and I think all of that was embodied in the automotive design and the automotive styling of that era it's just absolutely great by the way it's got pop-up headlights I mean that's so cool because now it, you've got a completely clean line across the front of the car those headlights when they're retracted they just sit flush with the rest of the bodywork it doesn't spoil the lines at all but when it gets dark outside oh there you go it's just the greatest thing in the world. I really absolutely love those pop-up headlights. Anyway, let's get in a little bit closer and take a look at the finer details on this 288. Getting real in close here on the grill, you can see that wonderful modeling and detail work, that texture work done by Kunos. Have a look at the lenses here on what I guess we could call the fog lights, basically the auxiliary headlamps here. Have a look at the detail there and the outer lensing there and then the inner lensing where the bulbs actually sit. That is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant work. You can see the indicator lights here and the marker lights, the same sort of detail there. You can see the screws that hold the little bezels on there, the outer lens surfaces, absolutely wonderful. You get the same detail on this side, of course, as well. That's so cool. And then, of course, you have the grill detail with the Ferrari logo. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Moving across to the top side of the bodywork where we get into the, the sheet metal aluminum and actually quite a bit of Kevlar and even some carbon fiber being used on this car. I, don't quote me on this because I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that this may be the first time that Ferrari used carbon on a road car. Not entirely sure if that's accurate, but I know that they used carbon and Kevlar pretty extensively on the F40 and this car being basically a test bed for the F40, I'd imagine that perhaps this was the first time that they decided to use carbon on a road car. Anyway, whether that's true or not, it's a little irrelevant because this car is just really cool anyway. Have a look here at what in America we would call the hood. I guess the rest of the world might call this a bonnet, but it doesn't really matter because there's no engine underneath it anyway, but you can see all of these big louvers cut in there just to extract some of that air out of the front end. Of course, radiators would be in this area, so things that you want to keep cool, and also you just want to vent some of that air, that air that's uh, underneath the front of the car there. A little bit of positive pressure on the underside that you just don't need because that would create high-speed lift. Anyway, moving down the side of the car here, just look at this clean design, uninterrupted lines really really great I do like how that that black it's not quite a pinstripe it's a recessed blackened area of the paintwork but it, it just runs down the entire length of the car I love it love it love it it very neatly divides the aesthetic between top and bottom it's really really cool additionally here we've got some great wheel and tire detail Michelin Pilot Sport Cup tires on there that lovely split rim design basically the same wheels that you'll see on the F40 as well and then of course your calipers in there and then the brake rotor behind that. Steel brakes of course because this is before brake technology went carbon crazy. Really really cool. Additionally there just below the door here you can see the jack point. <laughs> That's where you would put the jack underneath the car to lift it up. That's just absolutely great. I love that stuff. Love that stuff. Along the side here the driver's side door you can see the keyhole there and then of course the Pininfarina badging. That's really really awesome.
Looking inside, yeah, that interior very nicely modeled and it's very inviting. We'll go in there in a moment. Just looking around the front section of the car here, you can see those NACA ducts cut into the door and then they go into the fender there. That's to feed the engine. Really, really nice. You can see these very prominent rear view mirrors as well. They're a flag type design. They uh, don't look particularly elegant, but they do the job and hey, you need mirrors. Backside, here's where things start to get a little bit juicier. You can see here great tire tread detail there, of course, on this road car. They need to be able to deal with all sorts of different road and weather conditions. See these nice little gills cut here just into the uh, extreme edge of the three-quarter panel there. Really nice with the uh, grill work behind them. And then the rear end of the car. Looks reasonably quiet back here, but you can definitely see we've got our indicator and reverse lights and then our tail lights and brake lights very nicely modeled in there very nice very very nice indeed underneath you can see this is the gearbox casing emblazoned with the ferrari badge of course and then just above that to either side you've got yourselves the quad exhaust outlets of course twin turbo engine two banks of cylinders so you need exhaust for each bank and then you need some spillage for the turbo wastegates really really nicely done there kunos across the top face of the rear end you can see through the louvers there you can see the intercoolers <laughs> for the turbochargers that's really 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 awesome absolutely love that bit of detail in there great job absolutely great job kunos yes thank you so much for bringing us this car and on this side, of course, we've got ourselves the shadowed side, nice reflections in the paintwork. Again, the modeling that Kunos is doing these days, this is just absolutely superb. I mean, I could just sit here all day and just watch the thing spin around because it's absolutely mesmerizing. Anyway, though, we don't really want to just sit here all day and watch the thing spin around. So, just a couple more details here before we go inside. Have a look here. I want to get another close-up shot of those pop-up headlights because, yep, pop-up headlights, they're cool, right? There they are. And yes, when they come up, you can also see, look at the, the shut line there between the front bezel that you would have to remove by removing those screws, the four screws, two on each side there, in order to take that bezel off to change the bulb. It's all there. It's all there, and it's all really nicely modeled. It's so cool. You can also see the lower side of the headlight assembly there, how that also rotates when the headlights come up. We'll shut them down, and then we'll turn them back on. Watch the bottom side of that headlight assembly. It all rotates, as it should. That's all really, really cool. I mean, that's, that's detail. That really is attention to detail kunos good job good job good job all right i'll stop obsessing over the headlights now the other thing we can do of course because this is a road car in showroom view we can open up the doors oh that looks real nice that looks really really nice and there's that interior now not looking at it from behind the glass now looking at everything in there it just looks so nice there are your pedals down there your dead pedal there really really cool that big gear stick of course in that shifter gate that was a ferrari signature ferrari have gone away from manual road cars for quite some time now which is a tremendous loss to the world at large but well technology but yeah have a look at everything in there let's go in there into the cockpit now oh yeah just notice this. Have a look at the modeling of the door hinges on this thing. <laughs> they bothered to model the door hinges. It's just sublime. Let's shut the doors in here and give a better sense of proportion. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> yeah, well, it is 1980s. You're not going to see any USB ports. You're not going to see any audio auxiliary inputs. You're not even seeing a tape deck in this thing. As far as I can tell, you have maybe air conditioning. Definitely heat, maybe air conditioning. And then, uh, well, you got a five speed gearbox. Then you've got an instrument cluster. And you've got roll up windows. And that's about it. There are speakers in the door, so I'm led to believe that there would be a radio in this, but, uh, well. I'm not exactly seeing a radio there on the dashboard, but be that as it may, here's basically the view you've got when you're driving. It's 
it's good. It's really, really good. And I love that the the developers here have taken the time to show us all this detail in here because most of us will never even see one of these cars with our own eyes, let alone get the chance to sit in one, much less get the chance to drive one. But here it is. It's absolutely tremendous. Have a look at all of the detail in here, inside and out. There's the headliner, the sun visors that'll come down, the rear view mirror there, the vents on top of the dashboard, and then move in arrears here. There's your passenger seat, quite obviously, all of your controls there on the center console, your shifter. You've got buttons for up and down. They almost look like they'd be for electric windows, but quite obviously we have manual windows in this car, so not quite sure what that's all about. And then just you've got different sliders for different things, different switches for different lights and stuff like that. So, so very, very nice. Of course, the back here, a little bit of a shelf if you do, for some strange reason, want to store anything back there. But uh, that's about it. The only other detail here, have a look at the rear window. It's not quite a flat panel. It wraps around itself a little bit to meet up with those flying buttresses that are coming down over the rear wheels. Really nicely done. The seat detail itself, you can see here, very nice. You can see that leather detail. So very, very cool. Then, of course, your seat belt there. Nice, nice, nice. Great detail here on the door panel. You can see the handle that'll open the door as well as the little grab handle so you can push the door open or pull it shut. Really nicely done, Kunos, I have got to say. In terms of your instrument panel, it's pretty basic. You've got a tack on the right, you've got a speedometer on the left, boost gauge in the middle, and then a fuel gauge above that front and center. So, well, that's what you've got, and that's about all you need. The other gauges there on the dash, I can't quite make out all of them, but it looks like we have got ourselves water temperature, then probably oil temperature, and then another fuel gauge, it appears. No, that is oil pressure there on the dashboard there, and fuel over there on the uh, center panel. Really nice, really, really nicely done. Hats off to you, Kunos. You've done it. You've really, really done it. Head back outside now absolutely brilliant detail inside and out on this car I really can't get enough of this thing it has become my go-to road car in a set of course some days I'm just not feeling the all-out speed for an F1 car so why not drive something a little bit tamer emphasis on a little bit tamer and uh, well more often than not, I'm finding myself driving this thing, so that's why we're taking a look at this today. However, this being a review piece, we've got to drive the thing, so we're going to go to the Highland Circuit, which is fictional. However, it is very nicely suited for these road cars as well as some older race cars, so we're going to go to Highlands and have a look at this thing on the road next. Welcome to the Highland Circuit. Before we get out on track, as always, we're going to have a look through the setup screen and show you what's going on with this Ferrari 288. This is a road car, remember, so there are many fewer things that we can adjust on this car versus a race car, but we still have some time to play. Here on the gear display, you can see that we can adjust the gearing to some extent. We can adjust the final drive ratio, but additionally, you see, we have gear sets in this car. We have a US spec and we have an EVO spec. The EVO spec basically has a little bit shorter gearing in the lower gears, but our top speed still remains at 255 miles an hour. Theoretically, of course, assuming no friction, that's never going to happen. 255 miles an hour in a 288, no. But this is basically meant for track use, and then the US spec, this is meant for road use. You can see the final drive ratio does not change between the EVO and US spec. Tires, we've got three tire compounds to choose from. We have street tires. These are basically modern road tires that you'd get if you owned one of these cars and it was time to slap some new wheels on it. You could also use the Assetto Corsa 90 spec street tires as well as semi-slicks, which are basically meant for track only use. We're going to run on the street compound here. Fuel, we've got the fuel zeroed out to shut the engine down, but you can see the maximum fuel level in this car is 120 liters, as you might expect. Default is all the way down to 30 liters capacity, as you can see there. Alignment, camber and tow on all four corners, and that's about all the adjustment you've got in this thing. Generic, you've got brake power, and that's about it. You can't adjust the brake bias, you can't do anything like that, so you've got suspension alignment, fuel level, and then your tire compound, and your tire pressures, of course. Speaking of tire pressures, they default here at 37 in the front and 38 at the rear. They go all the way down to 15, if you like, and all the way up to 40. So play with that as you so desire. We're going to keep them basically at road levels here for our review today. 
We're going to run completely default setup. We're just going to load that back, reset everything to default. Fuel level is going to be fine at 30 liters. And without any further ado, there are the pop-up headlights again. Yes, okay, I'll, I'll stop, I promise. Anyway. The car's alive, everything looks pretty much exactly as it did in showroom view because, well, we don't have any digital monitors, no LCD liquid crystal displays, none of that nonsense, although liquid crystal was a thing in the 80s. It hadn't quite made it into road cars yet, so not here. Good old analog gauge cluster there. Tack on the right, speedo on the left, boost pressure and then oil pressure. That's all we really need. We can actually see the gauges now on the center console. You can see water temp, oil temp, and then fuel level. Really nice. Pedals in the lower left as always. I've supplemented that with our digital tack and our gear readout just so you can see what gear I am in considering there's no other way for you to know what gear I'm in. Anyway. Oh yeah. <laughs> there's that V8. Hi. Let's go. We're not concerned about speed here today. This is a road car. It's a very fast road car, but it is still a road car nonetheless. So we're not really concerned about speed. This is going to be a bit more leisurely. Of course, this car is quite heavily turbocharged, so you can also see the boost pressure rising there on the digital tack, in addition to on the dash. All the gauges in this car actually work, which is really cool as well. You're in fifth gear, which theoretically would top out at a 255 miles an hour. That's not going to happen for us here today. <laughs> That's not going to happen for anybody ever. A dab of brakes. So very, very nice. Running at a more relaxed pace like this, you can still see the car quite easily build speed. 140 miles an hour. 150 there and thereabout. Remember how old this car actually is? <laughs> That's pretty impressive considering its age. And the fact that it's street legal. Be a little bit cautious here over the bump, yeah. You will get airborne at higher speeds over that thing. Just pitch it in very gradually back on the power. You get great visibility from here. I mean, I'm uh, not really surprised at that, but I'm not used to getting such good visibility when I'm doing these reviews. I'm used to just peering out over the top of the monocoque. This, I've got a windshield and wipers and all kinds of cool stuff. It's, it's nice. Let's pitch it in nicely Get on the power. Wind it out a bit. Six grand on the deck. Oh, yes. Very nice. Very nice indeed. squealing from those steel brakes. In mid-range, once you're in the power band, there really isn't much in the way of turbo lag. At lower revs, of course, you are going to get quite a lot of turbo lag. That is the nature of the beast, after all. Here we should get some decent lag. Full throttle, nothing, nothing, nothing. There's the power. So, a little bit of lag. Nothing too earth-shattering, but enough so that you know it's there. Again, very similar characteristics to the F40, all things considered. With the cobblestone here, that force feedback feels really, really nice. Using the Alcantara rim here on my TSPC. Transmits the forces nicely. Revs. Wrap fourth. Feather it a bit. The car will want to drift out at these higher speeds through these long sweeping bends. There's third gear. On the power. 
power. Get a little bit of a gravity assist. Yes. Very nice. 7,000 RPM. Weight of 7,500. There's the gear change. 155 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. It's quick. It's legitimately very, very quick. And performance like that in a road car in 1984, when this car first came out, that's really something else. Some air there. Change gear mid-air. Why not? Flat through here. Yes. 157 miles an hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's cool. It's really cool. Bump, down, another bump, down again. Yes. Oh, it's so nice. It is so nice. Just on road tires. It's, it's good. It's really good. Really in that rev range now. Very mechanical sounding engine. Doesn't quite have the same harmonies as a as a V12 would. It's a V8. You, you know when you've got a V8 car, it's just it just sounds torquey. It sounds throaty. It's uh, it sounds like business. Back into the town square and on the brakes. Big blip on the throttle there on the downshift. A little bit of understeer. Let's pitch it in here. On oh, the power drift, yeah! <laughs> That's what it can do. Of course, over these cobblestones, not much traction. Oh, yeah, I'm starting to get a little enthusiastic now. <laughs> This is when we need to be careful. We have no runoff anywhere on this circuit. It's public roads. This it is so nice. That's a bit sideways. It keeps you honest. It certainly keeps you honest. It, it has a way of doing that. Yeah, the boost just keeps going and going and going all the way up to red line. It's so good. In terms of the handling dynamics, yeah, we're on road tires, so everything feels kind of like it's in slow motion relative to a race car. All of your inputs have to be more gradual. They have to be more exaggerated in a lot of respects because, I mean, you've got a road steering rack on this thing. You're not going to get absolute razor-sharp pinpoint accuracy like you get in a modern race car. It's just, it's a road car, and you got to drive it like a road car. You can push its limits, sure, but the, the limits are not quite as accessible, at least not on these tires. I mean, if you uh, put the semi-slicks on it, it, it becomes a little bit more feisty. But, I mean, even here on road tires, it's basically running on a road circuit it's uh, it feels very appropriate indeed there is understeer it is susceptible to snap oversteer particularly as the balance changes under braking but uh, for the most part it's it's quite tractable I'm not gonna say it's tame because as you can see we're doing 157 miles an hour in a straight line before we've got to slam on the old binders for the corners but uh, it's enjoyable it really is Of course, no ABS, no traction control, none of that. It's just you and three pedals and a steering wheel and a gear stick, and that's all you want. If this thing had any sort of electronic nannies, it would really spoil the experience too, too much. Back onto the cobblestones here. Controlled the drift a bit better that time miles an hour before we got to get on the brakes. Oh, it's so good. It's so very, very good. 
in so many, many ways. Now this engine, uh, we're pushing close to 400 horsepower. I mean, uh, it's down on power relative to the F40, of course, because even though it's a very similar engine, it's not quite the same. The engine in the F40 had a little bit more development time than this one did. And this basically was the test bed for the F40, like I mentioned before. So Ferrari took their lessons from this car, and then they applied it to the F40, which was all in all even crazier than this, as all of you well know. F40 with those big ducts cut in to everything, the gigantic wing at the back. Certainly not as civilized. This is almost civilized, I've got to say. Like, I mean, I could, uh, I could see driving this to a fancy party or something and uh, really not getting too many blank stares of disbelief, if you know what I mean. Yes, people who know would certainly know what this is, but most people, regrettably, or luckily, depending on your perspective, would probably just look at this as an old car. But uh, those of you who are educated know that it is anything but. Just a little bit of chirp in there from the front axle to come off the pedal and into the corner proper. It's nice. It's really, really nice, and it's a nice change of pace not to have to worry about hitting your marks exactly right and, you know, having to wait until you're about ready to depart this hearth <laughs> before you get on the brakes. It's, uh, it's a nice change of pace being in a road car for once. You don't have to push it hard to have a good time. It's, it's very, very nice. It's very tractable normal sorts of conditions, and I mean, you know, if you really want to push the limits, it will be there for you. But again, you've got to respect it because it is what it is. It's a 30-something-year-old road car at the end of the day. So if you are somebody who is used to the electronic nannies, who have integrated the electronic nannies into your fundamental driving style, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, just leave it at that, but do some laps, and uh, trust me, it's worth it. It really is worth it. what you need sometimes. Some of you are probably wondering, how does this compare to the F40 in terms of a driving experience? It's very comparable. It really is. As I demonstrated a few days ago, um, the F40 is quicker. You would expect the F40 to be quicker. I mean, first of all, it's got more horsepower. Secondly, it's had another couple of years of development. And thirdly, it was basically the world's first hypercar. So, yeah, the F40 is quicker. But not that much quicker, all things considered. It's the F40's more exclusive and, and I, on aggregate, I would say more expensive little brother. Yes, the F40 at auction today, that's going to fetch probably in the millions of dollars. One of these, though, it's going to fetch more. Of course, Ferrari never intended for that to be the case. And for the most part, they never really intended for this to be a road car. Again, it was made for Group B before Group B was sacked, but, uh, yeah, it's a little F40, and by little F40, I don't mean little at all, it's basically the same size as the F40. So I like that the engine's got a very wide torque curve for a turbocharged engine. You can leave it in third gear for all these corners and just let it drop into the mid-range of the RPM band, and uh, it's it's still got plenty of grunt out of the corner for you. It's uh, really very tractable. Of 
course, the twin turbos have something to do with that, but still, very nice. Very drivable. Only now I have to touch the gears. And if that'll only go down by one, this is going to end in tears. Ah, yes it has. Ay, that was expensive. That's what it looks like to crash six million dollars. Was that a six million dollar crash? It may well have been. However, um, we can remedy that little situation quite easily. Yeah. Let's just repair some of that damage and pretend that didn't happen. Yeah. Let's just do a little bit of make-believe. That didn't happen. No, it didn't. Yeah. Gonna be a slow pit stop. Yeah, it's okay. Take your time, boys. No big deal, you know. Pay no mind to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> that's this, uh, that's what this moment is all about. Yeah, and, um, now through the wonders of television, or the wonders of YouTube, you see no damage whatsoever. It's absolutely perfect. Not only is it a wonderful driving experience, but the car repairs itself. It's great. It's absolutely great. Ah, I don't know what I was thinking there. I was talking about pushing its limits, and how tractable it was, how manageable everything is, and I still managed to stuff it into the barriers. Oh well. I kind of figured that was going to happen at least once. I have to redeem myself now. Oh, that's slightly embarrassing. Oh, well. Notice I'm not making any excuses. Yeah, that was entirely my fault. And I admit it. <laughs> but that's the wonders of playing a video game. You have a reset button. Although, let the record show, I didn't use the reset button. I used the pit stop. Yes, about how relaxing it is. It, yes, it is uh, It is quite relaxing when you want it to be. It's also absolutely terrifying when you want it to be. Like right here, this is pretty terrifying. 156 miles an hour through a corner in a 30-some-odd-year-old road car. It's, it's mildly terrifying. But it can do it, provided you're a good enough driver for it. I'm not saying that I'm a good enough driver for it, as we have just evidenced. its limits. It's there for you, and it rewards you with a whole lot of fun. It really, really does. Let's see, here's where everything started to go wrong on the last lap. Carried a bit too much speed through here, left the braking too late. I really should be braking right here. I didn't brake till about here on the last lap, and that's the reason why we had a date with the barrier. At least I know what I did. Regardless of any spills along the way, it's still a wonderful car, and quite honestly, that's the reason why I drive it so much when I'm not recording stuff, because it's it's fun. It's a lot of fun. The modeling is great. The texturing is great. The sounds are great. The physics are great. Everything about it is just plain old great. And of course, you'll be able to hear the sounds a bit more clearly after the uh, commentated drive beasts, because, well, hot laps are to come, but yeah, this is awesome. Awesome, awesome. 
And there's our fuel warning light. You can see on the dashboard there, in the fuel gauge, the rightmost gauge on the center console, we've got a red light there as well, telling us that, hey, you're about to run out of gas, dummy. Do something about that. And I like it. That's it. That's the only bit of warning you have in this car. Everything else, it's up to you. There with the fuel level, the car is willing to give you a little inconspicuous red light that just happens to match the rest of the interior trim, so in your peripheral vision you might not even notice it. But it's not like the cars of today where they give you estimated range to empty and all that stuff. I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't need the computers. I don't want the computers. Just give me a steering wheel, three pedals, a stick, four wheels, and I'll have a nice day. I don't need any of the electronic gizmos. say in Italian, bellissimo. by doing that, but uh, it's fun. Of course, if I actually had this car, there's no way in hell I would ever drive it like this at risk of stuffing it into something because, uh, yeah, it's expensive. On the brakes, a little twitchy there on the back end. Just control it on the power. The revs build. 120 or so on the brakes. Turn it in. And back into town for the last time. We'll hit on this lap. Brakes. Basically, the only thing I can say about this car is just how wonderful it is. Everything about it is just superb. 100% superb. I am in absolute love with this thing. 
and I don't think I really have to explain why. I mean, it, it goes, it stops, it turns, and it looks absolutely fantastic while it's doing it all the time. It's it's just an absolutely glorious machine. It really is. It's it is the stepping stone between the 308 and the F40. Two iconic cars in their own rights. Yes, I know a lot of people, they kind of make fun of the 308, but you know what? The 308 was actually pretty good, all things considered. you got to remember what cars of the era were, and, well, that was pretty good. Yeah, maybe some Chevys were faster, but who cares? It was still a Ferrari, and it still looked like this. I mean, it's great. This is the obviously the ultimate design evolution of the 308, except for one other car which was the GTO Evoluzione, which, of course, was the immediate predecessor to the F40. But this is the road-going version of that, and it's absolutely fantastic in every sense of the word. And, of course, it's all sewn together and presented very nicely with a bow on top by the pop-up headlights. You just gotta love them. You've absolutely got to love them. I leave you, however, with hot laps to come from here at the Highland Circuit. I do, once again, thank you all very, very much for your engagement, your comments, your likes, your subscriptions, and, of course, all of your wonderful support. Hot laps are to come. Until next time, Ferrari Man 601 saying thanks very much, and we will see you soon.